<laughs> well, so far, things really haven't, ch haven't changed. I mean, they, they cut $100 million from their budget, which is not good. Uh, and uh, it, the budget process is still not over, so we don't know what it will uh, result in in the end. And he's basically kept um, the current management in place. Uh, you know, rumor has it, you know, he, he was uh, happy with the measures they took. You know, they, 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 they've taken a lot of measures. Some, some you know, we would criticize. You know, they raised the fare. You know, the, the 30 day unlimited pass went from $89 to $104. Mm -hmm. And from when it was implemented in, 19, in, in 1998. Uh, it was sixty-three dollars, so now it's one hundred and four. That's a sixty-five percent increase in those passes, even larger than the rate of inflation in Venezuela. So, <laughs> so, so, so that, those that, those were those were bad. And then he made these these service cuts, which I think were very harmful to the system. Uh, but then he also cut a lot of administrative fat, and he set up this thing called the, the Business Services Center because in the past uh, there are all these different operating agencies: the Long Island Railroad, Metro North. New York City Transit, uh, bridges and tunnels, uh, and they all would have their own legal staff and uh, accounting staff and human resources staff, and so he's, he's, he's consolidated all those into one business service center, which has the potential of saving a lot of money. And it's risky, you know, it's risky, you, you know, you, you could, be more, could be more bureaucracy. But, uh, so I think, I think uh, our new governor is sort of like that, that, that on his own. Because uh, during the Patterson year and a half, there wasn't that much direction about how to what to do. Um, you know, he take these actions. So, and and I think they've earned him a mixed reputation with the public, but with a lot of the, the political decision makers, he's uh, he's in pretty good. What do you think of the idea of Bloomberg wanting to take over MTA in New York City? Oh, I, I definitely suggest the mayor be drug tested. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, I'm cynical about this. Mayors always say this, knowing full well that they're never going to be taken up on uh, this. The agency owes $31 billion in bonds. They're going to refinance them to turn them over to the, uh, into the mayor. Um, and the mayor now pays about uh, well under 10% of the cost of running the system, which is about $6 billion, and he pays about $600 million. So most of the money comes from the state. All those taxes I mentioned before are state-enacted are state, uh, uh, taxes. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'm not sure it's such a good idea, you know, the, uh, the idea of some coordination between the commuter railroads and the subway makes sense to me, uh, even though it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating goal. So uh, I think the city can do more. I think the city should be contributing more than it, than it is currently to the system. But that was never popular to say during the flush years. And now, of course, with the, with the economy and the city budget being what it is, it's just very unlikely. And you know, uh, there, there are things that he does for the trans system that are good and things that I, I think are bad. One, one of the good things was there was a big fight last year about student metro cards. Mm -hmm. 550,000 kids get free or half fare, including my daughter, uh, to go to their school. Uh, and uh, uh, the state, Patterson cut it to, uh, he put a budget for the cutting it to $8 million. Uh, we had, it had been 90, we were going through all the numbers. Bloomberg you know, kept the city's commitment to student metro cards, which you know, politically it's not such a shrewd thing to do to, to deny free metro cards from 550,000 kids. Uh, but he, he did the right thing. Yeah, you know, uh, not a lot. I mean, I think they're a good idea if you want to encourage people to take transit and they have a, a, a two-seat trip, you know, make it easier for them uh, make that two-seat trip and make their uh, uh, transfer to, uh, uh, to a bus much more easy, you know. Um, and uh, the only, the only multimodal facility I know, there's some in the suburbs, which I'm woefully ignorant about, uh, but um, Fulton, Street, Fulton Street Transit Center is the main one in the city, and I, I don't know if everyone knows about that one, but as I mentioned before, it's a, uh, a, a way to rationalize. All, all, all our subway lines were built at different times by different entities, private companies, by the city of New York, 
And so even though they pass very close to one another, they sometimes don't connect. You know, you go on a cross town bus and you know, you, you have to debate your which should I walk? Yeah. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. and it's just it's it's just you can feel the stress as you wait on line with the bus and everybody's just really angry. And they do have plans, very controversial plans for a transit way on thirty fourth street, which some uh, number of residents object to. But one reason why we're big fans of these is that they're in place all around the world. You know, you, people like to think of New York as we're in the forefront and we can pioneer on, on select bus service, on bus rapid transit. We are incredibly far behind. South America is way ahead of where we are. Uh, and uh, and in those countries, who can't, many of them can't afford a subway because it's so expensive. Uh, they, uh, they've moved in the, the direction of these, of these bus routes. Uh, and it, it costs a billion dollars a mile to build Second Avenue subway. It costs a million dollars a mile to build the F-15 on Second Avenue. So you have a million dollars. So it's just infinitesimally small. And so it has the potential of neighborhoods. There are neighborhoods like the one I grew up in, the Sheepshead Bay, which uh, they have a plan to build uh, one of those routes down Ocean Avenue uh, from Sheepshead Bay. I mean, that neighborhood was slated for a subway in the 1950s. You know, the city surveyed the area. Uh, it would extend the line that goes to Brooklyn College, Massachusetts. It's never going to happen. Uh, you know, just as there isn't, there isn't any money. But a select bus route, it's a real possibility. And getting people to where they're going 25% faster uh, gives them much better access to jobs, to uh, taking the kids to places. You know, so, so I think there's the potential of expanding the system. and. Uh, but it's not without uh, its detractors. Oh, so many here, I, I brought the number. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. the, amazingly enough, the city says, so perhaps it's actually true, <laughs> that uh, in the last year and a half, there's been a 2% decline in weekday traffic volumes and a 3.4% decline in um, weekday traffic volumes since 2003. So it's not surprising, I mean, given the economy, there's less economic activity, and so there are less cars coming into Manhattan. It's still a whole lot of cars. Uh, I don't think you really notice the difference at, at that level. You, the city still needs to do something about congestion. We still support congestion pricing. Um, it's one of the possible funding sources that could fund the MTA's missing $10 billion capital program. It is wildly unpopular in Albany in part because Mayor Bloomberg is wildly unpopular in all the two things were closely associated. Um, so there were, there were renewed efforts to try and promote congestion pricing, and they're going to have to figure out whether to you know, put tolls on these river bridges or uh, congestion pricing. And you know, this is one of the things that I think are inevitable, but uh, I won't predict when it's going to happen, except to say it will happen in December. <laughs> SBS went live in October. That's true. October 11th. And here's here's a naughty question so you get to evade on uh, oh, DOT. <laughs> bicycles. We hear more people than ever riding bicycles, but also that there are more bike accidents than in previous years. What are the pros and cons of these bike lanes? Well, what can I generally say? My guess is they're not uh, wildly popular uh, here, and uh, people, you know, there is a serious problem in the city with bicycle riders not obeying uh, the, the, the traffic laws. Uh, I don't bike, so I, I don't personally uh, use them. Uh, I, I think, you know, what I think is this, which is that uh, for for many many decades, uh, tra transportation planning is focused around how to best service cars, how to make the streets wide for cars, how to make uh, maximum amount of parking given all the alternative uses, uh, and, uh, and very, very little of the space was devoted to pedestrians or bicycle riders. <coughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of the pedestrian plazas that they put in. Uh, one in Times Square. I went to Times Square with my mom as a kid all the time, and there was never any place to sit. You know, it was just, it was very un, inhospitable, and it was just, all these cars. Uh, so, um, uh, so I, I think generally trying to figure out how to share the space better, but I, I don't think I'll be foolish enough to uh, defend a particular bike lane, because I just don't know that. <laughs> Well, a number of people are saying it's, make, it's getting it more difficult to hail a cab, getting more difficult to cross the street, 
and um, that it's more difficult for handicapped people, and we are, are an aging population. Uh, the, there are a lot of um, programs like Safe, Safe Routes for Seniors, uh, which the Department of Transportation is working on providing. You know, there's still an unacceptably high level of injury with cars. I mean, people may be angry about the bicycles, but the, the cars do the damage, uh, serious damage. Uh, and so, so you know, the, this is controversial, but the, the uh, DOT has put in these pedestrian refuges, so, you, so you're halfway across the street and there's a place for you to stay. And I think that's a really good thing. I think it makes, it makes the environment much, much, much better for people who can't you know, run across the street. Uh, and can't can't make it this incredibly huge distance on some of the streets. Uh, so I, I think I think the he gives those in mind. I, I just I think the tough issue is balancing all those needs in a city where you have many different needs. Um, is there a forum no. for for balancing it? You know, yeah. how how is the decision making taking all of those different needs into account? This is where I might say that my colleagues at Transportation Alternatives, which is a group that deals with biking, is much better equipped than me to, to, to talk about the, the possible mm -hmm. forums. I know there's a lot of frustration. I, I, the neighborhood I'm in, uh, they put a bike lane on Prospect Park West, uh, which has reduced the traffic moving lanes to three. I think it's a great thing, but, but, but uh, the, many people in the community feel they haven't been adequately consulted with and there wasn't the real Forum for it. I, you know, in defense of the Department of Transportation, you know, they have been like on 34th Street, where the transitway is controversial because it's it's what you would call true bus rapid transit. It's a it's a great separation. You 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 can't just wander into the bus lane. You'll know you 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 you'll you'll hit a you'll hit a dip in, in the road. And people are worrying about its impact on on deliveries, uh, on emergencies, and you know, what DOT is doing is. Having a block by block review, they're doing a study. Yeah, they're doing a block by block, block review where they talk to superintendents and uh, businesses, and then they're doing all these open houses where people can express their opinions and concerns. So you know, I, you know, that's a particular project that they're doing uh, doing it for, and they tend to act that way by by project as opposed to uh, uh, the the general issue.